Welcome to the Talk of Simsbury. My name is Dominique Avery. Today, the talk is all about the Talcott Mountain Music Festival, which is back in Simsbury for its 22nd season. Joining me for the first time is Hartford Symphony's Artistic Operations Manager, Colette Hall. She's also a saxophonist. And Jean Bozzi, the symphony's principal timpanist. I'm delighted to have them both here and to give me a chance to talk about this summer's outdoor concerts, one of the highlights of the year here in Simsbury. Colette, it, it sounds to me like a really fun lineup this year. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having us on today, Dominique. Um, we're really looking forward to this year's season. We're gonna get things kicked off right away in uh, June 30th with our Celebrate America, so our traditional patriotic celebration of Independence Day. Our music director, Caroline Kwan, will be joining us for that concert this year. We're excited to have her back on for that concert. Um, you'll hear tributes to our military as well as um, Americana style music, and there'll be fireworks following the concert. So there's always something a little bit different. I mean, she did she, did you and she d decide what, what was going to be played this year in the middle? Or? Uh, yes. Um, we have essentially a core group of pieces that we like to feature each season, um, especially our Armed Forces Salute, um, uh, John Philip Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever, right. and Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overtures. Those are going to be the big ones that everybody recognizes right. from season to season. Otherwise, Carolyn and I, we sat down and discussed some possibilities for filling out the rest of the program, again with an eye towards Americana, um, American composers or music that just reflects, you know, the good old USA. <laughs> it's always a, a really fun contest. Uh, con contest. It's not a contest, a concert. Yes. And people Absolutely. enjoy the fireworks afterwards. And it's always a sellout, so oh, 10,000 yeah. people, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's our biggest crowd of the whole season. <laughs> but the rest of the, the, the uh, concerts are also pretty interesting and lean towards, very much towards pop and um, so tell me a little bit more. The next concert is? Yes, the second concert is Sgt. Pepper's 50th featuring Classical Mystery Tour which is on July 7th and for that we'll be bringing back the Beatles tribute band Classical Mystery Tour. They've actually been out at Simsbury um, in the past a, a few seasons ago mm -hmm. now and uh, we'll be doing the entirety of the Sgt. Pepper's album in honor of its 50th anniversary of the recording this year and then there'll also be some Beatles greatest hits in the second half of the concert as well. Uh, so I, I have not seen um, a, one of the concerts with a rock band. How does that actually work? It really works well because um, it, it's uh, it's a good. We play the background sort of. They bring a great band, um, really good guitar players, bass player, good drummer, and uh, the conductor knows the material really well. And and the, we kind of accompany them, you know, with with strings and brass, and we fortify the sounds of the Beatles. Particularly, a lot of those mm -hmm. albums had strings. It had and a lot of orchestration. And all yeah, that, so right. it just kind of expands. Right, I can hear know. it in my mind. Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. a really natural expansion of that orchestration that you hear on the album itself. Yeah, and right. so much of it is already there, and we're just supplementing it and making it even better. So it makes me feel really old that I remember when the album was released. <laughs> right? yep. Do you too? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right? But you don't. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Right. Okay, so the next concert. And um, that, that, that's the 7th, July 7th. Yes, that's right? July 7th. Um, the next concert's on July 14th, and that's the music of David Bowie. The legendary rocker, you know, rest in peace at this point. We're really looking forward to paying tribute to him and featuring some of his greatest works as well. And is that with a, um, a rock band as well? Yes, that will be with a rock band. Um, we have worked with the Winborn Music Group, and they have had concerts with us out at Simsbury in the past. Um, the music of Queen, the music of the Who, the music oh, yeah. of the Rolling Stones. So they're really, um, they, they've brought a lot of energy and excitement to our, our Simsbury concerts, our Talca concerts in the past. So we're looking forward to having them back with us this year. Okay, so then you're, and that's, um, that's the 14th. Yes. Right. Then you're moving into uh, what you call a sort of a film and um, Williams and Warner is what, <laughs> is what the title is. Mm -hmm. Yes. So talk about that. 
Um, we have a concert that leans a little bit more traditional every season, and this year we decided to feature the music from film composer John Williams, who has written the music to Star Wars movies, the Harry Potter movies, Superman, E.T., the list goes on and Schindler's on. Schindler's List. Yes, Schindler's yeah. List as well. So he's very prolific film composer who kind of straddles that classical pop's line um, and then also pairing that with music from Warner Brothers cartoons which features some amazing <laughs> classical music um, if you can you know remember the kill the wabbit and Looney yeah, Tunes yeah. those sorts of things sure, um, and, yeah. yeah exactly so it, it's fascinating I uh, I grew up without a television but my three and a half year old grandson loves the old uh, cartoons and so I was watching them with him, and I only then became aware of how much classical music is actually in them. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. So that's Friday the 21st. Mm -hmm. And, oh, Carolyn Kwan's conducting that one, too. Yes, she is. Yeah. So I, I love it when she conducts. So do we. Um, yeah. And then another sort of uh, pop kind of thing. Yes. Um, to close out the season on July 28th, we'll have Broadway A to Z, which features kind of what the title says, everything from ABBA, Mania, and the music from Mamma Mia, to Les Mis, to um, Wicked, Spamalot. There's a little bit of everything. So kind of Broadway's greatest hits from the last, I don't know. Years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Guys and Dolls is in there, I just, and Peter Pan and Rent. Oh yeah, yes. all of the biggies. Yeah. It sounds like fun. Now is that, so, you're playing timpani. Are, are these th are these concerts fun for you? Well, actually, that particular. Oh, concert, you're not playing I'm timpani. Probably playing you're not going to be there. Oh, yes. okay. No, I'm going to be there, and I'm, my favorite thing is to, especially in pops music or Broadway music, is to play the drum set because I've uh, I've been playing both all my life. So I really, you know, in in fact, to be honest, um, on a Broadway concert like that, there's a lot more interesting parts for the drum set than there are for the timpani. So. You know, uh, the timpani gets to do the last roll at the end. You know, okay, like, so it, that's it. You know. In a few minutes, we're going to get into exactly what you do. Yeah. But I just want to sort of stick to the program for sure. uh, stick to the program and the programs that you're <laughs> doing. Um, I'm I'm curious about how programming is developed. How do you decide what you're going to play? And it, and when this first started, it was a little more traditionally classical, and now you've moved away from that. But I think the entire Mm -hmm. uh, concert world has done that a little bit now. So, it, you talk a little bit how you develop and how you choose Absolutely. what you're going to play for this outdoor <laughs> audience. Absolutely, yes. Um, I would agree with what you just said of kind of the shift of it being a very traditional cl classical style pops concert where you might hear like classical music, but maybe also some um, Rodgers and Hammerstein and, and those, you know, kind of really traditional classical Broadway shows as well. Um, it's a long process of how we program the concerts. It starts over a year in advance. And we really try to first and foremost determine what our audience is for that particular program. And we've been out at Simsbury, like you said, 22 seasons now, so we have a good feel for what that audience is. It's you know very family friendly and oriented towards um, being able to have both young children but also adults really enjoy the concert. It's an outdoor venue, so we always take that into account as well. We're looking for things um, that are going to be exciting on a large scale. Um, and so the music that we select and the artists that we work with then reflect that audience and that venue. For Talcott then we're looking for a bigger sound because it is outdoors and it allows us to do some things that we might not be able to do indoors or might be overpowering if they're indoors. Um, that's why we love being able to do the Celebrate America music and have fireworks. That's obviously something we can't do inside. Right. Um, but also to have larger rock bands or the, like the Classical Mystery Tour come in because some of that's just a little bit too much if we're inside the Bushnell, for example. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how we sort of start that process. So let me ask you perhaps a very dumb question. 
do you know all this music already or, or do you go back and listen to it on a CD or, or, or however you listen to it now digitally? Or? <laughs> um, certainly not a dumb question, um, but I, I at first don't always know the music or I'm not familiar with every single selection or every single artist, um, but as soon as we start to consider anybody, then it's research time and I do go back and find their recordings and their music and, and try to make myself as familiar as possible so that we can and say yes this is a good fit and yes these are our quality musical selections that we want to put out there from the Hartford Symphony. So Jean I'm assuming you know more of the more more of the past music um, than Colette does. Well yeah like <laughs> David Bowie and, and, the, right. and the Sgt. Pepper sure. Right. You know. um, so how involved is Carolyn and um, and Steve Collins, the director? How are involved? Are, are you are you there picking out stuff, or you do you sit there in a meeting and? Um, we we sit there together. Um, it's a very collaborative process that's um, driven by Carolyn, as she is our music director and our artistic, you know, vision for the orchestra. Um, but she and I and Steve sit down together, um, we each bring our own ideas to the table to say, okay, here's kind of the short list that we would love to approach either in terms of the actual pieces that you're going to hear or the guest artists that you're going to see on stage. And we kind of hash it out between the three of us and whittle it down until it's small enough to be a program that we can fit into our series. So now another question, do you also consider what the musicians might like to play? <laughs> Yes, we do. We do, absolutely. And um, that while I, our audience might be sometimes first in our minds, of course we want to make sure that our musicians enjoy the music and that it is music that has high quality and is Im important and valuable for our audience to hear. And so I think when we're able to match up those two sides, that's when we get our best results. So, um, Jean, I'm actually asked a question. You smiled when I asked that question. Um, I didn't mean to ignore you, but um, I, I want to get to what you, uh, what you actually do and what role you play in the orchestra. And I've loved classical music since I was a teenager. I grew up in New York and um, somebody took me to Mahler's second at Carnegie oh. Hall with Leonard Bernstein and I just fell in love. Uh, but when I read that you're a timpanist, I thought, I don't really know a percussionist. You talked about drum set, tim, tim mm -hmm. what? Timpani, yeah. What is the difference <laughs> and... Um, well, you know, when you study percussion, especially in college, you learn all of the instruments. So, so y it's really uh, all encompassing. You learn snare drum and xylophone and timpani all, you know, equally the same and drum set also. Uh, when you get into an orchestra, then there's a dividing line between the timpanist and the rest of the percussion oh. section. So I know how to play. I played those other instruments. In fact, I was the principal percussionist for years before I became the timpanist. Um, but when you're the timpanist, you basically you basically play all the time because all of the romantic and classical music has, you know, everything from Mozart on has timpani. So uh, what is timpani? Is that kettle drums? Oh, those or? are kettle drums. Okay. Yeah, people know them as kettle drums. Okay. They're the, the big soup bowls up in the back. Right. You know? And uh, um, so, yeah, they're, and they're, I like them because I like, I prefer the low range in the orchestra and they, the timpani tends to play with the low brass and the strings, the, the basses and cellos. So you, they're tunable drums. You actually so, play. So I notes. was actually going to ask you about that because I mean, every once in a while when I'm at a concert, I'll see the tim the, the the timpanist lean over yeah. and do something to the kettle drum. I, I was doing that at a church concert once, and a lady asked me if why I was smelling the timpani. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you have to put your ear real close to it to get an accurate pitch. Because if, if you hit it hard with a stick, then everybody can hear it. So you got to kind of. Uh, listen carefully to it because usually the orchestra is in a different key and that note sometimes doesn't exist in the key that's being played so you have to sing you learn sight singing and ear training and so does it make a difference uh, playing um, the kettle drums outdoors uh, they, not they untune yeah, well, themselves <laughs> Not really. I mean, it, it's better. We have the shell now, which is mm -hmm. great. In Simsbury, that beautiful band shell is great. It makes it, it's almost like, you know, playing inside. Um, yeah, if you're just, like out in the field somewhere, yeah, the, the, there is a problem there because the, the, uh, the timpani, the sound tends to go kind of up and then out, you know, but if there's no shell or anything, it just keeps going up. So you, 
Yeah. The sound is actually, I, I find, extraordinary in Simsbury. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think yeah, everybody's absolutely. happy with the sound. You know, we're enclosed and, and that's important to project a unified sound out to the audience. So let me go back to the timpani percussion. Okay. So, so for our audience members and me, so percussion is like the xylophone mm -hmm. or what snare else? Drums, snare drums, cymbals, cymbals drum, yeah, triangle, big, right? Tambourine. tambourine. Well, you know a lot tambourine. of them. Were you a percussionist at one point? Wait a minute. No. How do you know all these things? No. Dominique. Um, yeah, that, and then it includes all kinds of strange things. You know, like uh, a couple of years ago, we had a contemporary piece where we had to play uh, auto parts. Mm. Like there was auto carburetors parts. and fenders and bumpers. Yes. And who, who was the composer? Um, uh, Mason Bates was Mason the Bates. Yeah. That. We did another piece of his uh, recently. Yeah. But, <laughs> so it's, it could be anything. Anything that you can hit can be a percussion <laughs> instrument. <laughs> Right. Interesting, but you so in this in the summer when you're playing outdoors, you're doing both. Um, I'm mostly timpani, and yeah. and that's the way. Again, the orchestra is set up that way, so that the person that plays timpani usually stays there, and the percussionists go from instrument to instrument. So uh, I get to be the lazy one and just sit behind the timpani. But um, but for like the Broadway concert, I'll play drum set, you know, and someone else will move over and play timpani. So uh, one of the questions that I had earlier um, today when I was preparing for this was um, I saw that you were a saxophonist yes. um, yeah. by, by mu musician trade and I wondered, oh, she's the artistic operations manager, but is she also in the orchestra? And I thought saxophones are not, I don't really connect saxophones with orchestra, so you're not in the orchestra. Yes and no. Yeah, but she has played with. I, you have played. I have oh, yeah. played with the with the orchestra yeah. um, on our final concert last season. We did Gershwin's American in Paris, which oh. calls for some saxophones. Yeah. So yes, definitely. I got to play that, which was really fun. Um, but normally, the orchestra doesn't have a, a saxophone part all of the time, like it would have a violin part or a trumpet part. Um, it's really the instrument didn't really get adopted until after the symphony structure or the symphony orchestration as it exists was formed. So it never really quite made it into the ranks of the orchestra. Instead, it, you'll see it a lot more in jazz, and that's really right. its, its big home. Um, so while I don't regularly play with the orchestra, I have played with the orchestra before. So There's it, a couple it, pieces, right? That yeah, there's, there's, there's a few really great pieces, yeah, really recognizable things. Um, like uh, Bizet's L'Arlesienne Suite, yeah, yeah. or there's um, an arrangement of Mazorsky's Pictures and an Exhibition by yeah. Ravel that has a beautiful that's, saxophone yeah, solo awesome. in it. Um, and we recently did Rachmaninoff's Symphonic Dances, which has a gorgeous alto saxophone and solo so you in played it as well. With that I did no, not. Um, my teacher, I went to the Hart School. My teacher there, Carrie Kaufman, was the saxophonist for that, and she did an amazing job. It was really beautiful. So um, you you. Both uh, uh, are sort of professional musicians, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I'm not sure that you can always make a living just doing that. So I know I, I understand that you both teach. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah we do. You, you used to teach at Hart? Yes. Yeah. I, I teach private lessons through the Hart School and uh, junior at the Academy, Greater Hartford right? Academy of the Arts. Yeah, I'm the music department chair there and have been for a while. Yeah. So uh, what so to go back to way, way back before we started talking about this, just what inspired you or how did you get into music in the first place? Jean, Jean, start oh, with you. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I guess I was always attracted to percussion instruments. Uh, my mom told me that I used to bang on pots and pans on the floor when I was a couple of years old. <laughs> so, I, And then I remember going, back then, um, they would go to a lot of weddings. All our relatives were getting married, and I would, they would drag me along to the uh, reception, and there'd be always a live band. It was way before DJs. Right. You know, so, and I would just go up to the bandstand, and, and the person I'd stared at was always seemed to be the drummer, you know, and I'd watch them. Um, so then that kind of led, one thing led to another, and finally they bought me a drum set, and I took some lessons and went to heart. So. There you go. I hope you yeah. lived someplace that, where there weren't a lot of neighbors. Uh, I think there were neighbors, but they were friendly, you know. So, so then, uh, to to, then you so you went to college. I went to yeah, I went to college for for music, and that's a good thing to do if you want to pursue a career in the music. You know, you there's a lot of great music schools around. 
um, and then you get your degrees in, in music and you, you know that doesn't ne guarantee you a job anywhere but you get years of experience playing in the student orchestras and stuff like that so you're pretty much prepared for your auditions when you get out of there. Mm -hmm. Colette, how did the bug bite you? <laughs> um, my mother always used to sing when I was little. Um, my dad not as as good of a tunesmith, but really enjoyed music. Um, and when I was, oh gosh, seven, I think, they bought me a piano, an old beat up upright piano from a friend my dad worked with, you know, for like 20 bucks or something to get it out of their house. Um, and so I started playing the piano at that age and eventually got into band instruments. I played the flute for a few years and um, was really lucky to have some amazing music teachers in my life. And when I was in um, middle school, my band director said, we've got 30 flutes and a band of 40 kids. <laughs> Does anybody want to try another instrument? And I thought, yeah, I want to be in the jazz ensemble. That seems cool. I want, I want to play the saxophone. And he took the time to get me started on that. And then my high school band director asked the really important question of, is anybody interested in pursuing music as a career? And, and so they really helped me to sort of realize that that was, was really important in my life. So I'm very lucky to have had some really valuable input from those people. How did you end up in the Hartford area? Are you originally from here? No, um, I'm originally from the Hudson Valley area in mm -hmm. New York. And so got here by route of school. Um, I did my undergraduate work in music education at the Crane School in upstate New York, and then went to Duquesne University out in Pittsburgh, and then finally ended up at um, the University of Hartford for my doctorate. So that's how I got here. Jean? Um, actually, I went to Hart also. Yeah. And, oh. and got my uh, degrees there. And where are you from? Uh, I'm from Connecticut, actually. So oh. uh, I you know, lived in Hartford for a while, and uh, when, when I was going to school, and then after for years, and. Uh, I, I had also really two really good teachers, really strong teachers, and one of them was the previous timpani in the, timpanist in the Harvard Symphony, Al Leepak, who was one of my t uh, teachers who actually played both drum set and timpani, and he's the kind of guided people towards both of those areas. You know. So, uh, just do uh, do a lot of people have no idea what you do and have, uh, and 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 how much technique it takes <laughs> pretty much yeah you know um when i leave my house my wife always says don't forget hit the big drum first you know so i mean but we make jokes about it and it's um it does it, you, when you see our percussion section is amazing yeah uh, really these are. guys can uh, they, the Bates piece that we just played had tons and tons of percussion every instrument you could think of the whole stage was covered with stuff and mm -hmm. these guys just are awesome. They can play all of the mallet instruments and the snare drum and bass drum and cymbals and everything is right in context and so difficult to do that. It really is. Okay, you just said mallet instruments. Okay, what are those? Yeah, oh, those that's the xylophone, the vibraphone, oh. uh, the marimba, and the orchestra bells. They're higher pitched. So you both have been playing for a long time, you longer than uh, Colette. Um, does it still uh, give you pleasure to play? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. It's, it's I'm, like therapy. Man. It's, you can't think of much else when you're doing that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you, your focus is totally on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know as a listener, or <clears throat> um, when I go to concerts or listen to music, there are some passages that that can evoke uh, goosebumps or um, tears in mm -hmm. me. Does that still happen to you? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Especially the endings of some pieces mm -hmm. and the, you know, so when you get to a particularly emotional moment i mean the full the music is loaded with emotion it really is and, and so do does i'm always fascinated by the fact that music has a peculiar power over the brain that to 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 do that mm -hmm. to cause goosebumps or make you cry mm -hmm. what is that do you know i mean i think it's been studied I don't know. Oh. That, <laughs> uh, that that's a tough one to answer um i mean for me again just echoing what jean said you know there are certain musical moments that yeah. really evoke those things um, and I know there are particular artists as well that that carry a lot of emotion and a lot of j just passion and, and talent and dedication to their work and and those are the most inspiring things and I don't know that that's just present in music but maybe becomes more apparent because you get to feel it live and you get to be there with the audience and you get to see the people on stage like 
just really owning their craft and, and basically putting their emotions out there for you to feel. So I, I don't know if that's the I right that's answer. that's one reason but <laughs> why we all play music is, mm -hmm. is to, to affect people. You know? And why, so, why, why people yeah. continue to go to yeah. listen to yeah. music, right? Yeah. You know what? Our time is up. Oh. Wow. Um, I'd like to thank um, my Hartford Symphony guests, Colette Hall and Jean Bozzi, for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure. It's thank lots of fun. Well, thanks for having yeah, us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone to everyone here at SCTV Behind the Scenes uh, for getting, uh, getting the show on the air, including our volunteer studio camera people, Sam Davidson and uh, Wanda Coleman. And finally, thank you for joining us. If you missed any portion of the show, you can always find it on our website at simsburytv.org. I'm Dominique Avery. See you next time for the Talk of Simsbury. Since 1984, SCTV has been the place to turn in Simsbury to watch local government in action. But we are more than local government and school meetings. SCTV is the only place where you can check out all the candidates in local elections. We have high school sports and exercise classes. Other shows keep you up on health, finance, poetry, music, and Simsbury hot topics. Now we need your help. Simsbury Community TV is embarking on a major capital fundraising campaign to bring SCTV into the 21st century. We've received a generous grant from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, but now we must match it. We want everyone to watch us on TV or on our website, but even if you never do, please help so that we can continue to keep your government open and you informed. Someday, when there's a crisis, you will want SCTV to be there. Hi, my name is Greta Loro, Vice President of Personal Insurance Sales with Summit First Insurance. I hope you'll join me in supporting SCTV. Since 1984, your connection to your town, your schools, and your government. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.